Welcome everyone to the University of Connecticut's Digital Media and Designs coverage of the 2021 Super Bowl. With our world dealing with a pandemic, this year's Super Bowl is certainly unique. Attendance is limited at the stadium itself. Sponsors have adjusted their marketing approach and Americans are not gathering as usual. The game itself presents a fun matchup between the greatest quarterback of all time, playing his 10th Super Bowl, and a young star playing in his second straight. Our students today, just beginning their semester of research, will share today what they are seeing across America as consumers go online to express their views. For those new to this field of study, we have the capability here at UConn through our software to view all publicly available digital and social media data and analyze that information live. This provides us with insights which can tell us what people are sharing live on various media platforms. In addition to our student team today, we'll be joined by a guest panelist, Matt Barry, a UConn graduate of our digital media and design program, and currently an expert analyst at TalkWalker in New York City. Matt will be joining us at the end of our broadcast. Also, as a side note, we will be on Twitter at UConn Smack, that's U-C-O-N-N-S-M-A-C-C, -C, tomorrow, Monday, with some interesting factoids regarding how people felt regarding this year's Super Bowl. So without further ado, let's get started as I know we have a lot to cover in the next half hour. First up today is Bryn Thomas. Bryn's going to talk to us about the TikTok pre-show that she's been researching. Bryn, uh, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, so um, today there was a tailgate TikTok pre-show for the Super Bowl. Um, it was hosted at 2.30 and it was two hours long. Um, this was the app's first ever tailgate um, and it featured Miley Cyrus um, as the main performance. And the special thing about this event was that um, the concert took place in front of 7,500 vaccinated um, healthcare workers that the NFL invited to attend the Super Bowl in Tampa, Florida. Um, and TikTok is an official partner of the NFL for this experience. And um, the NFL joined TikTok at the start of the 2019 season. And currently they had 5.7 million followers. And then after this live show, I checked, they gained 5.9 million, which is awesome for them. Um, in addition to this event, TikTok also has brand partnerships with um, Pepsi and they're using the hashtag Pepsi halftime challenge. And um, this is, they created a filter that fans can use and they will be using the song Save Your Tears by the artist The Weeknd, who is the halftime headliner at the Super Bowl today. Um, but that's all I found on the TikTok app today. And yeah. Wow. Do we know, Bryn or anybody on the panel, do we know, is this the first time TikTok has been an official sponsor of a Super Bowl? And is this representative of TikTok's growth in the industry? Do, do we know that? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't do research on that, but um, TikTok is a relatively new um, social media platform. So it sounds like this is the first time that they've done something like this. Yeah, and I'm wondering, um, Bryn, with the pandemic going on and not a lot of live events able to be held in, this, in the uh, Tampa area, doing this on TikTok was uh, needed and, and a stroke of genius at the same time. Cool. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Bryn, appreciate that. Um, next up, Grace. Grace uh, Colley is gonna talk to us about Sarah Thomas, I know that today um, we have the very first female referee of a Super Bowl. And uh, Grace was doing some research to see how people are reacting to that uh, out on social media. Grace, why don't you tell us what you've been seeing? Yeah, so I did my research on Sarah Thomas. Like you said, the first female to ever be officiating at the Super Bowl. So it's a pretty big deal. And I pulled in some data from the software TalkWalker um, looking at mentions of Sarah Thomas across all social medias and um, mentions of the name Sarah Thomas along with words like Super Bowl, football, 
first female, female official. And I found uh, the theme clouds that TalkWalker provides very interesting. So I can share my screen and show you these theme clouds here. Can you, sh can you see that? Yeah, we, we get it great. All right, so yeah, so these are the hashtags that come up when you look at uh, mentions of Sarah Th Thomas. So hashtag football is female, women in sports, uh, Sarah Thomas. If we go down here, you can see some emojis that are used with mentions of Sarah Thomas. You can clearly see some excitement, uh, references to sports. And as we scroll down, top themes are history, uh, Sarah Thomas, woman, referee. And these are some accounts that are speaking of Sarah Thomas. ESPNW, so women in sports is what they comment on. The NFL, uh, Christina Aguilera, I believe. And then some of the bio information that our, um, TalkWalker can pull out of the bio information of who's talking about her. So it seems like these are women, fans of sports, and, and so on. So clearly people are, are very excited about this and um, happy to see a woman breaking barriers. Yeah, so clearly um, Sarah Thomas is getting a lot of play on social media across the country. Um, and all of it seems to be positive. We're not seeing any negative uh, talk on social media regarding her officiating the game at all, it seems like. Yeah, correct. I haven't seen anything negative. That's great. That's, that's huge. Good data on that, Grace. All right, thank you very much. Anything else you want to tell us about uh, Sarah Thomas, or are we good on that? Well, one more thing is from that data I pulled, uh, yeah. generated 13,000 results within the United States and a, a pretty narrowed in uh, data search. So a lot of people are talking about it. That's great. That's great. Good work. Thanks, Grace. All right, next up, uh, we have Caleb White. Caleb, um, did some research on the goat and this whole goat topic, Caleb, uh, anybody, well, since we're all at home, it's only the people in my house, but this whole talk about goat in every sport drives me nuts lately. And, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes, baby goat, I mean, really, you can't talk about goat until someone's played at least 15 years. Having said that, I can't wait to see what you found about goat. No, I mean, I agree with you. I think Tom's a GOAT. But obviously, as Tom returns for his 10th Super Bowl in just 20 years, it obviously comes as no surprise he's considered by many uh, to be the greatest of all time. And as you mentioned more frequently, this is abbreviated to the acronym GOAT. So for the Super Bowl, I was interested to see just how many people are discussing um, what their opinion is on Tom Brady's status across social media channels, uh, particularly right as this um, big game approaches, especially as he was on a new team. So I looked across the past 24 hours as well as the past uh, week in the past 24 hours, discussions across social media regarding Tom Brady's status as the GOAT have increased over 108%. Of that 108%, there's been a 136% increase in Twitter discussion, uh, which now claims 74.4% of all discussions surrounding the topic. So it makes sense as Twitter is a platform where you can share much more personalized ideas and it's quick, um, quick snapshots of anyone's opinion uh, anywhere at any time. So. Uh, the next largest share, just to give a comparison, is coming from online news sources, sources which is just 11.7%. But as you can see, the runner up to Twitter only claims not even a seventh of what um, Twitter claims right now. Now, obviously, being in New England, uh, Tom Brady is a fan favorite amongst both men and women here. But it appears as if online is predominantly men who are sharing their opinions on who they believe to be the greatest of all time. 83% uh, of discussion online uh, comes from men. So that's pretty interesting, which, you know, around here, it's a lot more commonplace, but nationally, uh, men are definitely dominating the conversation across social media. Um, regardless how you feel about them, opinions from both the naysayers and Brady fans alike have skyrocketed in the past few days as well. Uh, although the Super Bowl is now here, many anti-Brady football fans have come out to voice their opinion on social media, which led to a 98% increase in negative sentiment uh, surrounding Tom Brady as the GOAT on, across social media the past uh, 24 hours. Uh, that being said, it's fair to say that the Brady fans definitely outnumber the group who are against him, with uh, them having 174.5% increase in positive discussion as well surrounding the topic, as opposed to the 98% increase in negative. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, the kind of main question that I was looking for was, does social media agree that Tom Brady, Tom Brady is the GOAT? 
Uh, so it's safe to say after my research that he is with 87.9% of all total discussion either being positive or neutral, contrary to the mere 12.1% who believe otherwise. When you were, that, that's some great data, Caleb. And when you were looking at the GO conversation, did you happen to get a chance to look at sentiment? Were there, are there, were there people like, uh, just they're upset about the whole conversation about GOAT or they didn't like Tom Brady or they didn't like Patrick Mahomes. Was there any negative? Yeah, that? yeah definitely. That was kind of my um, last statistic there. Uh, so kind of to wrap it all up, um, there has been an increase in both positive and negative sentiment. There was a 98% increase in negative, uh, but, but an almost 175% increase in positive, which led to that kind of final number I got that 87.9% of all total discussion is either positive or neutral in sentiment. I'll be curious to see what we see, you know, when we, tomorrow we take a look at it. Yeah, tomorrow, after the game. Depending on the result of the game. But, you know, Americans are, our attention span is about eight seconds. And if someone has a good game, all of a sudden they're the greatest thing ever. If they have a bad game, they're the worst player ever. Yeah. <laughs> 10 games in 20 years isn't bad either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like I say, I don't, I, no matter what the sport, you can't even be talking about GOAT unless you've played at least 15 years. So I don't want to hear anything about any player until they've played 15 years. Cool. Thank Thanks a lot, Caleb. Now, I know the um, our next speaker, Emily Pearl. Emily, I know um, one of the unique uh, things about this Super Bowl came about because there's hardly anybody allowed in the arena. So the stadium itself, I think, has about 20,000 people allowed. Most of them, or if not all, have been vaccinated, et cetera. But because of that, they have this huge space available. And what I'm hearing is that, the, uh, is that CBS is going to cover this in a cinematic or a cinema type of presentation to give it a unique coverage since everybody is stuck at home. Um, I know you did some research on Emily. Could you give us some background on what CBS is really doing and what you saw on social media? Yeah, well, I was looking into like different articles about like what types of cameras they're using and how like that's gonna like show on TV, like for like what we're gonna see from that. And like the past couple of years, like the style for filming has gotten like more like better and better, like doing cooler stuff each year. But this year, like like you said, because of COVID and not, there's not gonna be as many people in the stadium. They're really taking advantage of the space they have because um, this year they're going to have like trolley cameras. So they're going to be like zip lined across the stadium so they can get from one end to another. And it says it can go up to like 65 miles per hour, which is like pretty fast for a camera. Um, so it'd be able to show like a lot of like action shots and like really like see the game. Um, and then there's also going to be a lot tons of on field cameras. Um, they're, apparently, this is the first time this year that they're using two Sony um, Venice cameras. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but um, they're like the way that they um, show, like shoot. It's usually like first uh, commercials and like TVs, TV shows, um, but they use full frame like image shots that show like short depth. So it's a really like unique and like cinematic like style rather than like. Um, typical just like camera for like sports um and this year they're also having a 53 foot movie bird cane which is like typically only used in like big like major motion pictures so it's gonna be really interesting seeing that in Super Bowl because it's gonna give like a very dramatic like sweeping shots of the game so it's gonna be definitely a totally like different and like really cool experience from home wow I'm wondering usually the Super Bowl they always uh whoever's covering it trots out some new technology that may stick or may not stick depending on how it goes. But all the, uh, the things that you just mentioned, I, I can't even imagine if in the future, even some of that sticks and uh, we're able to see games on, on all sports using some of that technology. Um, also what I'm thinking, Emily, is just put my professor hat on for a minute. When we take a look at, and maybe Matt can help us with this, when we take a look at how people felt in the coming days regarding the coverage. We'll be able to see if uh, consumers liked what they saw or did. Yeah, definitely. It's gonna be really interesting to like see that track that on social media and see how people respond to like the new style of like filming for the Super Bowl this year. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate it. All right. Next up, we have um, next on our 
hit list of students, Joe Shiro. Joe, you had the uh, luck of the draw to talk about the most anticipated ads and talk about you know, maybe how some of the brands decided to cut to, to advertise during the Super Bowl or not advertise and donate money. So tell us what, you, what you've been seeing out there, Joe. Yeah, so out here uh, in the commercial landscape, I've been able to break my tradition of typically waiting until the actual event to watch all my favorite commercials. But from Doritos to Miracle Grow, uh, it's very interesting to see how companies are using their brands and using celebrities to advertise their products or websites. So going off the top of the list, I found that I was able to break down commercials into three main feelings. And uh, basically the emotional feeling, the funny feeling, and the engaging type of feeling. First and foremost, uh, some emotional commercials you're going to want to keep your eye out for is Bruce Springsteen's Unification of America ad. Also, Bass Pro Shop's Get Outside ad is really cool and also just very emotional for viewers uh, who are fans of hiking or going outdoors. Um, lastly, the Bud Light... <clears throat> Bud Light Seltzer, oh, sorry, wrong one, sorry. Uh, Guinness's goat commercial with Joe Montana will also be very interesting to look at, especially with the conversation regarding goats. Secondary, we have funny commercials. Now, there are a ton of funny commercials you can look out for, but one of them that stuck out to me most was Bud Light Seltzer's last year's Lemons ad. Now, in last year's Lemons, uh, basically a bunch of actors talk about how in 2020, Life gave us some very different lemons compared to uh, years past. And basically the commercial goes through, you know, the pitfalls of 2020 uh, while also using lemons as the stand-in for any potential issues that happened last year. Um, another really funny commercial to look out for is the uh, Frito-Lays the night before the Super Bowl ad. I really liked it because it included a lot of football legends and a lot of people are talking about it on social media. Now, transitioning into commercials that people are talking about on social media, it's important to keep your eye out for, <clears throat> sorry, um, the Bud Light Legends commercial. This uh, commercial will be having many of Bud Light's past spokespeople coming together for one really big ad, and also Amazon Alexa's latest ad uh, featuring the new body type of Alexa with uh, Michael B. Jordan is definitely going to create some buzz. Last but not least, some engaging ads to look out for are John Cena's Mountain Dew Berry, uh, Mountain Berry commercial. Uh, that will be a actually a sweepstakes where if you count the correct amount of Mountain Dews, you will win a million dollars. And secondary, uh, the Miracle Grow ad has been generating tons and tons of talk because John Travolta stars in it with his daughter. They do the Grease TikTok, TikTok dance, and a lot of people have been uh, talking about how much that uh, brings back their nostalgia and their feelings for Greece. And so, yeah, just some things to look out for, for the Super Bowl and ads that are coming at us tonight. Sweet. Joe, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you didn't expect this, but what do you think is going to be uh, on social media tomorrow when you take a look at it? What ads are going to win in each category you brought up? So I definitely think for emotional ads, uh, the let's grab a beer ad is going to be talked about. Um, that ad kind of struck an emotional core with a lot of viewers. I found that it um, kind of encompassed the whole, you know, last year we may have not had that great of a year, but we have each other. And that togetherness is something that's really interesting, especially on the human aspects of life. Next, the funniest ad I think we're going to look out for is, um, yeah, uh, Frito-Lays was the night before uh, the Super Bowl. I think it's really cool that they got all these different football legends together. Uh, last but not least, it'll be interesting to see uh, Fiverr. They're throwing their hat into the commercial ring with a unaired commercial. A few commercials haven't been aired yet. So those are like the sweepstake ones. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, new companies who are throwing their hats into the Super Bowl ring, you know, try and come out strong or if they flop on their first try. Right. Good, uh, good info, Joe. I'm going to ask you tomorrow to tweet the results of the winners in each category. Sweet. Yeah, I definitely will. Well, thanks a lot, Joe. Appreciate it. Great work. All right. Um, last on our student roundtable, Carson Fitzner. Carson, 
you had another twist regarding the ad space. Um, you're dealing with who's addressing COVID and who's not addressing it. Basically, from an advertising perspective in the digital and video space, you know, around the COVID pandemic, uh, I'd love to hear what you've been seeing out there, Carson. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great follow up on uh, Joe's points based on all the new uh, guys coming in, getting opportunities to make commercials for the Super Bowl uh, and like have their shot at it. <clears throat> so obviously with COVID uh, being a huge part of our lives for the past year, um, it's gonna have some effect on the Super Bowl, um, the Super Bowl ads and the companies and the decisions that they make towards those ads. So um, after some research, I found that Budweiser, Pepsi, Coke, and other major companies that we um, in the past few years have seen commercials frequently in the commercial or in the Super Bowl, uh, they decided to opt out of putting commercials in the Super Bowl uh, and rather take that money that would be used for production and donate towards COVID causes. Um, so after doing some research of Budweiser uh, pre-Super Bowl, I saw a lot of positive feedback based on their decision to do this. Um, a lot of people supporting them in their decision saying it was the right thing to do, um, which was was good to hear, um, especially because Budweiser is one of those companies that you expect to see it. So it really could have gone either way. A lot of people could have been upset about it, um, hoping they could see that commercial, um, but it did go in a positive uh, feedback way. And then on the other hand, other companies have decided to lean into the idea of COVID and even use that to create entertaining advertisements, um, such as the one Joe mentioned, Miracle Grow. Um, and I did read an article. So basically the concept of it was um, Miracle Grow did have a good year in the past year. So one of the lines was, ah, the backyard, it had it quite a year. And then at the end of it, the uh, host of the ad says, I say, let's keep this backyard thing going. So there's a little bit of controversy already there. Um, because that company had a good year, doesn't mean that everyone else did. So there's kind of that, that push and pull between what, where are you pushing that, those boundaries? Uh, what can you say with these ads? And how are people going to react to it? So those are some of the questions that I had after doing some research. Um, how are these companies making these decisions? What's best for their company? Um, and how is it going to affect the, uh, the brand vision and how other people view their company afterwards? So I think this is a big topic that we're gonna be able to look at uh, after the Super Bowl. Look at these brands and see it, if their decision um, on how to advertise or not advertise or spend money a different way, um, how it affected their brand image their brand sentiment uh, in the next couple of weeks to see if it was the right thing to do for them. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, that would be interesting. As a matter of fact, before I go to my next speaker, our guest, Matt Barry, um, I'm going to, all each of you, uh, Bryn with the TikTok show, uh, Grace regarding Sarah Thomas, uh, Caleb with the GOAT conversation, em em Emily with the cinematography of the, of the event, and Joe and Carson regarding the ads. I ask each of you, let's go take a look at what happens in the next 24 hours to seven days to see um, how people felt about your various topics of research. I, I think that's gonna be interesting. We can uh, tweet on, on, our, on our UConn Snack channel. Uh, hi, sorry, John. Um, I actually do have one more topic here about, uh, about sports betting. Sorry, I'm not on the sheet, but. That's okay, Michael, jump right in. So what were you gonna come for today, Michael? Okay, so uh, for the Super Bowl, um, it's no surprise that the Super Bowl is one of the biggest gambling events in the sports world that happens every year. It's an estimated that $4 billion is being wagered right now. Even with only 18 states having it legalized, it continues to grow at an astronomical rate. Um, uh, because it's so big, some of the wagers uh, range from like what color Gatorade will be on the sidelines to the length of the national anthem to how many players are gonna have how many yards. It it all varies and people are putting a very large amount of money on all these different ones. So some of uh, some of the things I found online was um, from the date February 5th to February 9th, negative sentiment involving the sports betting has increased 10%, which means is that as the game, game became closer, more people disliked the idea of sports betting. However, 58% remain neutral and 32% remain positive. So you also saw a slight decrease in the, in the neutral category and a slight increase in the positive. 89% um, of all the media topics involving the Super Bowl betting came from Twitter. And mostly what I saw on Twitter was uh, these accounts that try to advertise themselves as um, 
knowing knowing bets, knowing what to put put on. You see a lot of parlays on there too. So it's it they show a lot of their earnings, what they win, and trying to get people to uh to join in on what they're doing. Um, also, the gender split involving the topic of sports betting, um, no, with no surprise, it's 83% males, 17% females. However, we see, converse, we see conversations increasing um, over the past week of 8,200 for women, while only 2,200 for males. So even with the disparity, you see more women talking about it as the game gets closer. Um, and also, conversations involving um, where Super Bowl bets are being played are being placed in, in different countries. You see the United States at, at 87.3% to no surprise, but then you see Canada right behind that with the UK and with the NFL trying to expand into Mexico city and hopefully um, creating an expansion team in the near future, them being at the fifth lowest of 0.4% kind of came to a surprise for me. And I guess I just want to wrap up uh, with what I, with something I saw is the largest bet on the game right now is 3.46 million on the bucks at three and a half plus three and a half. Uh, this uh, the the person who placed this bet is a mattress store owner. His name is Jim Mattress Mac, and he is uh, he's known for placing astronomical sports bets on almost every sport. So, yeah, that's a was did. that bet is that was that the largest or most significant topic, um, volume wise, uh, on social media? Was it getting a lot of play? Yeah, no. When I when I was doing my research, I saw that as the top. It was it it almost it went viral like two days ago with uh on twitter and and just on espn because the bet is so absurd but yeah and tell us again what's what's the bet what's he uh, betting on so basically he's betting on the bucks at plus three and a half which means the bucks would have to win or lose by less than three points and he'd be paid so if they were to lose by more than the field goal then he will not be paid and lose 3.46 million so wow you know that that's a great topic to follow, Michael. Um, there's so many angles around gambling, especially around the NFL, um, that we could be researching. And I'm curious to see, um, you know, depending on the outcome of the game and the, and the number, like who wins or loses by X amount of points, what uh, data you see in the next 24 hours. And is it, does it spike just like right after the game or does it go on for days? Um, so I think we're going to look to you to, to tweet about that this week, Michael. Great topic. Good research, Michael. A lot of good numbers there. Thank you. Well done. All right. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Matt Barry. Matt is a uh, UConn alumni uh, from our digital media and design program. Matt now works in New York at TalkWalker. Matt's joining us from his house in East Lyme, Connecticut today. Um, Matt, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you, uh, spending a few, taking a few minutes out of your Sunday to join us. I know that you're covering the Super Bowl, uh, for uh, talk Walker itself. And if you want, you could, you know, you're able to just share a, a few things that you're seeing out there live right now. Yeah, sure. Again, thank you for having me guys. Let me get it up right now. And what we're essentially going to be looking at right here is a report that we've made for all of those from our marketing team, from a public standpoint, I'll make sure to share the link with you guys if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into this. But a lot of what you're gonna see is already points that you covered. So kudos to you guys on that. Really what we try to do whenever it comes to social listening, especially what I was taught from Mr. Murphy at DMD is trying to find as many different angles as possible, especially when it comes to something be it Super Bowl or something regarding a brand that you may work with or just current events. So what we'll start with first would just be general conversation around the ads. And as you can see, we're just looking at all the results and engagement right here for all the ads. We've put in about 60 plus ads in the platform so far. So this should be covering a fair gambit of everything we're going to see tonight. And the two that we're going to see right here that'll be of big note or Robin Hood and Budweiser. Budweiser is really representing a brand that didn't put in an ad for the Super Bowl. So as Joe was talking about, really the brands that aren't going to be there was driving a lot of conversation. And then with Robin Hood, it's a tale about a brand that is having a really bad brand crisis right now, but is largely trying to ignore it by playing the Super Bowl ad. And as you can see, just these two alone, they're really driving their reach or their share of engagement as well. 
Another thing that we've looked at as well with the ads, not only from an aspect of why they aren't going to be at a Super Bowl, but what are they doing with their own ad spend? So I'm sure you guys have heard about Avocados from Mexico or Pepsi or other brands putting more money into social media when it comes to really looking to newsjack the Super Bowl, as we would call it, or just hijack an event and make it about their own brand. And as we can see, a lot of it is really positive overall. So Avocados from Mexico decided to pour all their money into social media marketing by doing what they called the Guac Bowl, which was just a sweepstakes on social media, giving away different products or different prizes with Troy Aikman, as well as um, the other lead reporter from the NFL on Fox. And it's largely been well received so far. And as we look over here, some of the brands that Joe was mentioning as well, the Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's, this has what we would call a 92% net sentiment, meaning that it's only going to be factoring in on the positive and the negative of a post, so completely disregarding the neutral overall. Then in terms of gender and age, this is huge whenever we're looking for just any conversation regarding ads, so we want to get a basic idea of what the demographics are going to be. And with it being the Super Bowl, it's largely male, 25 to 34, but we do see a significant female population as well, which is great to see overall. And then lastly, with the theme clouds, this I like to call a distant cousin of our theme clouds. This is what we call our sentiment key drivers. And while they have all the same capabilities of a theme cloud, the only difference is that we're going to have this little sentiment legend below here, just showing us the overall conversation and the tone of it. So as we can see, we see a lot of guac bowl, avocados from Mexico, win big. This I thought was very interesting, the Fortnite creative and the 5G built right. So this is something that Verizon is doing after the Super Bowl. They call it a big concert for small business. And it's taking another example of a concert or an event that's being hosted in the game Fortnite. So you're gonna see some artists performing on a live stream, but there's also that video game aspect with Fortnite that's going to be showcasing another platform in action around this event. Boy, Matt, when you look at the stand that theme cloud, there's a whole segment of society, probably 55 and over, that is not aware of the Fortnite game creative, the 5G built right sweepstakes. There's a whole economy going on around the Super Bowl and, and these brands. And I'm betting a lot of people are unaware of, but folks inside the industry are very aware of. Exactly. And you'll see that with the Super Bowl, different demographics and different ages are going to be marketed to in different venues. So while you may have someone that's only going to focus more on the TV side, you may look at someone else on the lower or the younger end of the spectrum, say in that 18 to 24, about 25 to 34 range, where they may not have the standard cable package, but they're trying to stream it. So that's just another example of how these demographics could be marketed to differently. Great. That's great data. One more thing, Matt, if you could scroll back up, I, what jumped out at me in the sentiment, T-Mobile, 53% negative. What's happening with T-Mobile today? So this is around an ad that was quote unquote banned. We'll see if it was actually banned or if they actually used it to generate buzz. But it was around an ad that featured Gronk and Tom Brady talking about the overall speed of the platform. And the scenario that they were using was Brady called up Gronk around March of last year and said, hey, what's my next move? What do you want me to do? And Gronk was saying, oh, you know, you should stay in New England. You shouldn't retire, run it back. And the excuse that they used was, oh, if this weren't on T-Mobile's 5G network, they showed the ad again. And it was a splintered up Gronk call where it was like, retire, you're old, don't run it again. So Brady took that the wrong way, decided to sign it with Tampa, and that's apparently how we ended up with the current situation today in T-Mobile's eyes. Wow. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. And then just in terms of the team side for a little bit and the overall game, what we've just monitored from the overall Super Bowl week, so from January 25th to now, around 3.5 million mentions have been made about the Super Bowl and the overall sentiment's been positive, as well as the share of media type has primarily been focused in on Twitter. The further down we go though, as we break it out by teams, Tampa Bay is really leading the conversation, 
And the, really the main driver for them is Tom Brady. So people just talking about how he's in his 10th Super Bowl, how he's able to do this at his age. There is some negative sentiment around him as well, just with regards of past experiences. But he's really driving the overall conversation around these two teams. Will it translate to if people think he's going to win tonight or if it ends up in a win? We have yet to see. But the way it looks right now, people are more excited about Tampa Bay and their overall players than I would say Kansas City right now. And then if we look at the sentiment here, it ekes out a little more in favor of Tampa Bay, but from a net sentiment standpoint, it's really Kansas City. And as we look here, this is gonna get more interesting as the game evolves. This is that net sentiment, but now shown over time. When I do a lot of use cases in the sports sector, particularly just around games, it's great to just match up the two fan bases and see as you know the winning side goes from negative at first to then in the green, and then see the reverse with the other fan base where they may start off in the green and then go lower into the red as the game evolves. So Matt, as, as we wrap up, um, does it look like America thinks Kansas City is going to win? So I would say overall, just judging by the mentions, it's leaning more towards Tampa. In terms of sentiment, they would lean more from a Kansas City standpoint. So in my own personal opinion, I would lean more towards the Tampa side, just since more people are talking about Tom Brady and the overall players. And again, we'll see as the night evolves who could really win the conversation overall. But as of right now, I'm giving Tampa the edge. Matt, this has been really cool. I, I appreciate you sharing the, uh, the live dashboard with us that you'll be working on uh, for Talk Walk over the next couple of days and obviously tonight. This has been really cool. Thank you. And kudos to you guys for all the great research. It's really a great starting point to get this experience in your career. And the more experience you get in the platform overall, the more fun you're gonna have with this data. Just seeing everything that you guys were pulling out right now, it was really a lot of points that we were talking about a lot in the office when we were building this out this week. So hats off to you guys. Thanks, Matt. So I'm gonna go around the, uh, our gallery and I'm gonna ask for each student to tell us uh, their prediction for the game, either based on personally or uh, some data they're saying. So I'm going to start with Carson. Carson, what do you got? Um, I'm going to go with Tampa, uh, just as Matt mentioned, for the, just the amount of mentions towards them. Uh, I think it'd be cool to see Brady win with a different team. So we'll see. All right, you're on the record. Emily? I think Tampa Bay too, because I know I think Brady's a good player. And since now, now he's not on the Patriots, because I'm a New York fan, so now I'm re rooting for him. <laughs> okay, cool. Michael. Uh, I'm going to go with the Chiefs. I think uh, I think Patrick Mahomes is too good. I think the that they have the best tight end in the league, so I got to go with the Chiefs. Awesome. Two to one. Joe, what do you got? Yeah, so I have a bunch of buddies who live in Florida, so uh, if I had to go on record, I, I'd have to say Tampa Bay. <laughs> Very excited. All right, three to one. Brent, what do you got? Um, I'm with Emily on this one. I think Tampa because of Brady. I'm not a huge football fan, but um, I think Brady's going to lead them to a win. Wow, awesome. Grace, what do you got? Got to say Tampa, too. Have to root for Tom Brady. Wow, wow. Caleb, what do you got? I got the Chiefs going up early, but then I got Brady doing a classic comeback, so I'm going Tampa, too. All right, I've, I've got uh, Tampa winning by three points at the end. So it looks like we're heavily tilted toward an upset with uh, Tampa coming out on top. I guess we'll find out. All right, that's all we got for today. This is our first uh, YouTube show of the spring semester. We're gonna do a few more before the end of the semester. I wanna thank all of our students for joining us. I wanna thank Heather and uh, Mike for producing, I mean, for running the show behind the scenes and for Ryan Quigley for producing and putting this all together for us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday. And for our guest, Matt Berry, our UConn alumni for joining us today. Um, thanks everyone. Everybody can now uh, go back, enjoy the rest of the evening, enjoy the ball game, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Good night, everybody. <laughs>